Father, we do think of our sister Judy and would ask that you administer to her needs today. We ask that you would guide her uh, in her recovery, that you would give wisdom to the, the medical professionals that work with her, uh, not only the ones that are related to the surgery, but those that are related to whatever rehabilitation she is involved with. And I would ask that you would help her with the pain. And I would ask, Father, that you would help her with um, the stamina that is required for uh, recovery and rehabilitation. And I would ask that you would bring her home at the soonest possible date. We would be grateful for that. Pray that you would give all those that are working with her wisdom as they uh, walk alongside her. And I pray for Doc as he walks alongside her, that you would help him as well uh, to, uh, to be able to minister to her needs. Somebody said in, in a recent email that they have been through a lot over the course of the last couple of years, and they have. Uh, numerous surgeries, some significant illness, and uh, they've, they've walked a difficult path over the last couple of years, and I pray that you'll minister to them through this portion of that path, and we'll be grateful for that. Father, we sometimes confuse relevance with trendy contemporary culture as a people and even as believers within that culture we sometimes forget that our most relevant problem is sin and that sin separates us every one of us from our creator and that relevant problem has a, a relevant solution and that solution is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That may not be trendy. People don't want to hear it. But it relates to each one of us in a profound way at the point of our greatest need. And it's that need that Jesus addressed in John 14. And we're going to be looking at that passage here this morning. We want to solve life's greatest problem. There is a solution. But there is only one solution. Our problem can only be solved God's way through Jesus Christ. We want to thank you, Father, for our partners in ministry. We think of Ken and Donna Wells and their work in pastoral training. We were just talking about this this week, uh, actually with the Penningtons. And it was, it was great to be with them for a meal and just to catch up a little bit. We're grateful for the fact that they are at 89%. would ask God that you would continue to bring in their support and push them out to the work of translating the word of God into the Aka language as quickly as possible. We do think of the Wells, and we're thankful for the work that they are doing training pastors in various parts of the world. In some situations where the pastors have next to no resources. They may not even have a full copy of the Bible. And, and yet they're pastoring a church. And Ken and, uh, and Donna are in the work of training these people. And I pray that you'll give them wisdom as they do that work and as they, they provide help for men who desperately want it and need it. We also pray, Father, for Ted and Becky Fletchell. We're grateful for the work that they have done over the years in a difficult place. They were serving in Germany, a place that um, is for the most part um, closed off, not, not politically, but in terms of the way the people think. They don't want to hear the gospel. Uh, from their perspective, they've been through that in some part of their history, and they don't want to hear that. So we are grateful for the work that they did in establishing a church there. I would ask that you would guide them in their work now as they are retired and living in Ankeny, Iowa, that you would help them as they continue to serve you in that capacity. Think of our brothers and sisters down at Liberty Baptist Church in Pueblo as they meet this morning, that their time together would be an encouragement and they would uh, lift up the name of the Lord Jesus not only in their church uh, and, and in their facility, but around Pueblo as well. We also pray for our son, Chris, as he works with uh, National Christian Foundation and working with those who are um, serving the Lord and with those who would like to give to people who are serving the Lord and would ask that you would uh, help Chris as he puts those folks together. 
Thank you for those who serve us in the civic arena. <clears throat> Sometimes, Father, as we pray, we, we, we think, I, I don't know how to pray for these people because they disagree with us on so many things. They disagree with the word of God on so many things, and yet you've told us to pray. And so we pray for our senators, Michael Bennett and John Hickenlooper. We pray for our state senator, uh, Thomas Exum. We would ask God that you would minister to each one of these people and help them to make choices that would be in keeping with the word of God. When they don't make those kinds of choices, then I pray, Father, that there would be a prick of their conscience, that they would understand that, that what they're doing is hurtful and wrong, and we would pray that that would be the case. We also pray for our mayor, John Southers, in the last few days of his responsibilities, and we pray for our city and county, for, county first responders, for our city council person, Stephanie Fortune and Wayne Williams, and for our county commissioner, Lon Hinos, Gonzalez. And Father, we pray that you would minister to each one of these as they serve us on the local level. And Father, in just uh, uh, less than a month, we have an election here in our area for mayor and city council and, uh, and, a, and a ballot measure or two. And I pray that you'll give us wisdom as we think about who we would like to see lead us in uh, the local areas. And we'll be grateful for that. Now, Father, strengthen our resolve to share Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles to John 14. We're going to be in verses 4 to 6. We were in verses 1 through 3 last week and talked about um, this wonderful passage, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, where I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and it's going to be in my Father's house, and if I go and prepare that place, I'll come again and receive you. It's a wonderful passage. But you know, when you're going someplace you've never been before, you need help. Back in the day, you needed a paper map. You know, one of those things you unfolded while you were driving? And then hand it to somebody else to fold back up because you knew you couldn't do it. And you found your starting point and your ending point and you figured out the best route to get from point A to B. Nothing on the map told you what was the best route. It just was a map. And so here's the best. So I'm, I'm going to go this way. I could tell you a few stories about maps. We don't have time. And then you kept referring to the map along the way or you had a navigator in the passenger seat who told you where to turn. Distracted driving is not a new thing. We've been doing distracted driving ever since we've been driving because we've had maps. Or you got directions from someone who knew how to get there. You go north on Elm Street until you get to Casey's Drugstore and then you take a right on 19th Street and you take that until you get to the big oak tree on the left and then after the oak tree you turn left and it's the third place on the right that you can't miss it. And you went north on Elm Street for two blocks and you were lost. Or you got a guide to go along with you. Someone who knew how to get to your destination. Somebody who could tell you where to turn and how to get where you were going. But today, we just plug in our destination into the GPS. And that GPS is on your phone or your car dashboard and it tells you where you are and where you're going and the best route and how long it's going to take to get there and the traffic problems you're going to have along the way and the speed limits and every turn you need to make and when you get there you're in the middle of an open field. <laughs> it'll even recalibrate if you choose to ignore one of its directions and it'll tell you recalibrating. That's, that's, that's a GPS language for you're a moron, you should have turned right there. What you don't want to do is start driving with no idea where you are and no idea where you're going. In our passage this morning, we have a conversation between Jesus and Thomas about how to get someplace the disciples had never been before. Now, just context here, we're still in the upper room. It's still during the Last Supper. So the rest of the disciples, minus Judas, are all sitting there listening and to some degree participating in the conversation that's taking place. 
But as Jesus speaks, it's Thomas this time who answers, and his answer is a logical question. I mean, a, a question we might have asked had we been in his shoes. Keep, all, keep in mind, it's also still in the context of Jesus going away to prepare a place for his disciples in heaven. So, let's pick it up at verse 4. As I mentioned, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is speaking. Verse 4, he's still speaking. It's still him. It's actually a continuation of what he was saying in verses 1 through 3. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. That wasn't a question. That was a statement. Jesus is making an assertion. You know where I'm going. And you know how to get there. Peter has been saying, asking a question, where are you going? And why can't I follow you now? And everybody in the room is saying, where are you going? And Jesus said, you know where I'm going. And you know how to get there. Now let's, let's just refresh our memories here a little bit. Um, what Jesus had said to them up to this point in the conversation in the upper room. Chapter 13, verse 33. Where I am going, you cannot come. Verse 36, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Later on, you'll go where I'm going. Chapter 14, verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, where I am, there you may be also. So there are clues in his previous statements in this conversation, particularly the reference to my father's house. Now, I want you to think about this also, because sometimes we look at what Jesus says and we say, and, and this might be one of those, we say, you know, he's telling them they know where they're going, and they really don't. Well, they should have. Come back to chapter, we're going to stay in the Gospel of John. Come back to chapter 6. Look at verse 62. <clears throat> John 6, 62. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? That's a clue. Chapter 7, verse 33. Then Jesus said to them, he's speaking to the Pharisees at this point, and you're going to recognize this because it sounds like what he's already just said to his disciples. I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Chapter 8, verses four, starting with verse 14, I'll read down through verse 18. Jesus answered, and again the Pharisees are questioning, and said to them, and you say, well, he's talking to the Pharisees. That's true, but his disciples are standing around. They're all hearing this. Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Skip down to verse uh, 21. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So there are statements as to where Jesus was going to go. Where I go, you know, is not a tease. He's saying to them, I've been telling you all along. I came from the Father, I'm going back to the Father. I've been telling you that all along. He'd been telling them that someday he would return to his father who sent them. And then he also said, and the way you know. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. Now, the disciples were looking for this proverbial map, right? They, or they want him to say, I'll start walking, you come behind me like mother duck and little ducks. Okay, that's what, I, that's what they were looking for. Maybe verbal directions. But he had something much better for them, as we'll see in just a moment. And Jesus had also been giving them the road map to the Father throughout his ministry. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You want everlasting life with the Father? It's through me. John 5, come back to John 5. Verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in me, who sent, believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Chapter 6, verses 37 to 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and they... And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And one more, chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So again, for him to say, you know the way, was not hyperbole. He was not kidding them. He had been telling them all along how to get to the Father. Now that brings us to verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Thomas was a man with questions. He was the man who would later doubt the resurrection. But I want you to always also remember that Thomas was a man of courage. He was the man who said, when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, who said to the rest of the disciples, let's go with him and die with him. And Thomas is the man who tradition tells us took the gospel the farthest away from Jerusalem of any of the disciples of which we are aware, all the way out to India. It's that Thomas that had been listening to this conversation. He heard Jesus' comments. He heard Peter's questions. He heard Peter's bold assertion in chapter 13, verse 37, I will lay down my life for you. Mark tells us the rest of the disciples all said the same thing in Mark 14, 31, which would have included Thomas. So here's Thomas sitting there, and he's, Thomas has this sharp, inquisitive mind and he's assembled all the information, but to Thomas it doesn't add up. I, I'm not getting this. I'm, this is not computing yet. <clears throat> I need to ask a question. So Thomas asks, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Essentially, Thomas said, Lord, Peter just asked where you're going, and I, I didn't get the answer. I didn't understand the answer. You didn't say Capernaum or the desert or Mary and Martha's house. You didn't say Rome or Jerusalem or Athens. You didn't even say heaven. We, we don't know where you're going. You just said where I'm going, you cannot come. I think I speak for everyone in the room. We do not know where you are going, and that's Thomas. <clears throat> then he said, since we don't know, know where, we sure don't know how to get there. How does one reach an unknown destination? Unless you're Abraham. God just said, go and Abraham started walking and God kept pointing him in the right direction but how do you reach an unknown des destination so Thomas hears what Jesus says and he says I don't know where you're going and that means I don't have any idea how to get there either and that brings us to verse 6 Jesus answer in verse 6 is classic it's classic for its thorough simplicity and it's classic for its exclusive direction. I want you to notice, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, that Jesus did not say, I can show you the path. He didn't say that. 
He said, I am the path. Jesus was not pointing the way. He did not pull out a map. He didn't go off and stand in a direction and say, go this way and that way and the other way. He didn't even say, I'll guide you. He told them, I am the way. Now, he said three things in this. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And they are different thoughts. And they are, I would say it this way, too. They are equal thoughts. And we should not make the mistake of blowing past any of them. First, he said, I am the way. The path to God is not religion. Now, you might think to yourself, whoa, wait a second. Aren't you a religious dude? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I, I do think that what we, some of what we do is religious. James talked about religion, pure religion and undefiled before God is this. And then he described religion, taking care of the fatherless and the widows and keeping yourself unspotted from the world. So it's not that religion is necessarily bad, but religion won't get you to heaven. In fact, well, hold on a second. I'll tell you the in fact in a second. It's not morality. It's not being moral. There are people who are pretty moral as unsaved people. <clears throat> we have neighbors around us, and several of them we know are unsaved. They are moral people. They, they do things in a moral way. They have standards, and they, they live by those standards. Morality won't get you to heaven or to God. Patriotism will not get you to God. As good as those things may be in some contexts, hell will be populated with religious people who lived relatively moral lives and were lovers of their country. You know what? You could kind of look at the Pharisees and say, that's a pretty good description, the Pharisees. The path to God is not religion. It is not morality. It is not country. The path to God is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for you, defeating sin. No one else did that. He rose again, paving the way to eternal life. No one else did that. He sits at the Father's right hand right now, interceding for you. No one else is doing that. No one else is doing that. He is preparing a place for those who trust him. No one else is doing that. He is the way. He is the path to God. He also said, I am the truth. He is God's revelation to mankind in the flesh. John said it this way earlier in his book, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the only one who accurately portrays the Father. He is the only one who revealed the Father to us in himself. We're actually going to get into that next week in the, in the message. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled prophecy. There are, multiple compete, there are not multiple competing truths. There is not my truth and your truth. That is postmodern nonsense of the first order. There's not my truth and your truth. There is the truth and there is error. The truth is opposed to error. If my quote unquote truth doesn't line up with the truth, then what I have isn't truth. Jesus is the embodiment of authentic revelation. He is truth. And then he said, I am the life. He has life in himself, John 5, 26. He is the resurrection and the life. He spoke of that when he was speaking with Martha and talking with her about the fact that her brother was dead and would come to life again. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. It is through him that we can have everlasting life. We already quoted John 3.16. If you are alive today, and I'm assuming everybody here is alive today, you seem to be, you're moving and breathing, and it's because God in the person of Jesus Christ created you. He gave you life. And if you've placed your faith in Christ, he gave you eternal life. 
He can give life because he has it in himself to give. He is life. I am the way to God. I did not come to light a path, to blaze a trail that you may simply follow in my tracks, pursue my shadow like a prize that's cheaply won. My life reveals the life of God, the sum of all he is and does. So how can you, the sons of night, look on me and construe my way as just the road for you to run? My path takes in Gethsemane, the cross, and stark rejection draped in agony. My way to God embraces utmost loss. Your way to God is not my way, but me. Each other path is dismal swamp or fraud. I stand alone. I am the way to God. I am the truth of God. I do not claim I merely speak the truth as though I were a prophet, but no more. A channel stirred by spirit power of purely human frame. Nor do I say that when I take his name upon my lips, my teaching cannot err, though that is true. A mere interpreter I'm not, some prophet voice of special fame. In timeless reaches of eternity, the triune God decided that the word the self-expression of the deity would put on flesh and blood and thus be heard. The claim to speak the truth, good men applaud. I claim much more. I am the truth of God. I am the resurrection life. It's not as though I merely bear life-giving drink, a magic elixir which, men might think, is cheap because though lavish it's not bought. The price of life was fully paid. I fought with death and black despair, for I'm the drink of life. The resurrection mourns the link between my death and endless life long sought. I am the firstborn from the dead, and by my triumph I deal death to lusts and hates. My life I now extend to men and ply them with a draft that ever satiates. Religion's page with empty boasts is rife. But I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. If you plug a destination into your GPS, it's likely to give you two or three options, one of which will probably be highlighted, if your GPS is anything like mine, as the best of these routes. Might even tell you on the side, this one's slower by X number of minutes, or this one has a wreck along the way. But the, fa the fact that there are several possibilities means you have viable options. However, you may be traveling to a place for which there are no other options. If you want to drive to Key West, there's only one road that gets you there. There are places here in the mountains where that, that, that present that kind of a situation where there's really only one way to get where you want to go. That's the situation we find in verse 6. And our pluralistic culture doesn't like that one bit. We want choices. If you have a television and it's on at any point in time, you're probably going to see an ad from Phil Long. Phil Long likes to say, choices, we have choices. That's the American way. We don't want to be told there's only one way. That frustrates us. What if I don't want like that way? What if I want to go a different route? What if I want to take a route that's not the same one that everybody else takes? I don't care what Jesus said. I'm going to try a different way. However, Jesus said the journey to the Father's side is exclusively through him. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's very narrow. That's very exclusive. 
And you know, there's a lot of Christians today who don't like it and won't abide by that. They want to say that you can get to God from other directions. You don't have to take the only path that gets to God. You can take another path. And you'll still get there. But Jesus said you can't get there any other way. You can't get there through Buddha. You can't get there through Muhammad. You can't get there through Mary and the saints. You can't get to the Father through anyone else but Jesus Christ. That is the only path that's open to you. I didn't make up that rule. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. And Paul reiter- not Paul, Peter reiterated that in the book of Acts. Neither is there, cert- is there salvation in any other, any other what? Anyone other than Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is only one path to the Father. And it goes through Jesus Christ. No one else. It is faith in Christ and Christ alone that leads us back into a relationship with God. It is faith in Christ alone that releases us from the stranglehold of sin. It is faith in Christ alone that places us into the family of God as adopted children. It is faith in Christ alone that opens the door to the Holy Spirit's indwelling. It is faith in Christ alone that gives us access to God in prayer. It is faith in Christ alone that sets our feet on a heavenly path. Nothing and no one else can do any of that. Only Christ, by God's grace, through faith alone. Gentlemen, Jesus said, you ask, where am I going? I'm going back where I came from, back to my father. Where are you eventually going? Will you go back to the Father someday as well? Those of us who know Christ are all going back where we belong. Back where we were created to be. At the Father's side. In my Father's house. The way back to God is clear. Jesus made the path as clear as it was possible to make it. The disciples may have been confused going in, but there was no mistaking what Jesus said in verse 6. You want to get to the Father, you get to the Father through me. The path to the Father is clearly laid out for us. It's also clear that there is only one path. All roads may have led to Rome, but only one road leads to God. You can't get there any way you please. You get to God, God's way or you don't get there at all. And the way back to God is Jesus. He is the exclusive path. If you're trusting a religion to get you there, you're sorely mistaken. And I don't care which religion you want to mention. I don't care if you want to talk about Baptist or Catholic or non-denom or, uh, or Buddhist or Mohammedan or whatever. Name your religion. I don't care what religion it is you're trusting a religion to get you there you're sorely mistaken if you're trusting your good works to get you there that's not going to do because your good works aren't good enough i don't care how many you have or how life along a life you lived if you live as long as methuselah you won't do enough good works to get you to heaven if you're trusting your heritage or your parents faith or anything but faith in the shed blood of jesus christ you're on the wrong path Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way to God. Is your faith in Christ? That's where your trust needs to be. If you want to be restored to the person that you were created to be and part of the family of God, Jesus is the way. Spell for prayer.
Father, this passage is an answer to a question. Verse 6 is an answer to a question. It's also a very exclusive statement, and a lot of people don't like it. A lot of people hear this and say, oh, I don't like that at all. I want there to be multiple paths. I want to be able to go the way I want to go, the way that feels most comfortable to me, and still end up in the right place. There are all kinds of people who, who believe in a, one form of universalism or another, where we're all going to end up in God's family and in God's presence. It's just going to be wonderful. And yet, that's not what Scripture teaches us. It's not what Jesus teaches us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, God give us a, 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 an appreciation of that as followers of Christ so that we can continue to not only believe it for ourselves, but proclaim it to the people that we know who, who are not on that path, who need to know Christ. There are people in our acquaintance, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our work settings, in our recreational settings, people that we know who need Christ. And they're pointing in that, in some other direction, hoping that they're going to get to God in the end. And I pray that you'll help us to, as followers of Christ, keep in mind that there is only one way. And Father, if there's somebody here who doesn't know Christ today, I pray that you'll help them to see that Jesus is the path. He's not just the map. He's the path. That the way to the Father goes through Jesus Christ. And that today will be the day they place their faith in the Savior. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.